Hello everyone, welcome to our monthly InfoSec seminar organized by the Information Systems Security and Assurance Management Department in Mihalshan School of Management. This is the last seminar in this academic year, so unfortunately we will miss you for the next two months and we will see you again in September. Today we have a special seminar as we have two interesting presentations from our current master students. Each presentation will last around 30 minutes, including Q&A. The first one will be given by Lillian Bizadi. Lillian started studying Master of Information Systems Security Management in September 2021. She is currently working for Crescent Point Energy Corporation as a security cybersecurity intern during summer. Lillian has experience working on projects which aim to develop and the management and the manage information security awareness and training procedures for the organizations through NEST and COBIT frameworks using BSAT and ESET modules. She also has experience working with same tools like Splunk, which are used for real-time monitoring of the organization's information security. Prior to starting her information system security journey at Concordia University of Edmonton, Lillian gained her Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from University of Alberta and had been working as an electrical engineer for the oil and the gas industry. Lillian also has experience working on different projects for network security, DRB, GRC, system and virtualization security and cryptography courses during the last two semesters. Her research is focused on the programming languages used in blockchain development and security. So it's all yours now, Lillian. Thank you, Dr. Aslam. And thanks everyone to join this InfoSec session. I'm just sharing my screen and starting to present. Um, here I'm going to talk about an overview of programming languages and the blockchain technology um, development and security. So um, I'm going to talk about the, what is blockchain technology, different categories for uh, programming languages, uh, different blockchain, blockchain platforms that we have, and um, smart contracts that are used in the blockchain technology, following by the blockchain technology vulnerabilities and security. So what is a blockchain technology? Blockchain technology has gotten a lot of interest because of its vast uh, range of potential applications. It began as um, a, a cryptocurrency known as Bitcoin that most of you have heard about, but um, it was um, now being used um, by the um, wide range of businesses and organizations. Uh, unlike the most existing uh, systems, uh, which are built in the centralized um, platform frameworks and platforms. This new um, system um, relies on the peer-to-peer -peer, um, network and the distributed systems to keep transactions, including the uh, blockchain registries. Uh, it has a structure of a digital log file um, and is kept as a series of connected groups uh, called uh, blocks or known as blocks. Uh, each block is cryptographically linked to the um, one block before it to the previous block and uh, the block cannot be adjusted or altered after it has been added to the blockchain. Many security experts uh, believe that the blockchain system's in in intrinsic uh, cryptographic nature is sufficient to withstand frequent hack and uh, security threats. But some other investigations on the security and privacy of blockchain technology, on the other hand, um, have re revealed that um, the numerous applications have been successfully cyber attacked. Um, so this shows that the, the previous studies um, have not focused on the blockchain technology cybersecurity vulnerabilities extensi extensively and enough. And still, we need to do more research on that um, matter. So, um, sorry. Okay. How, the, uh, how does a blockchain work? As you can see in the picture, a blockchain works in the following way that first the user initiates a transaction. After uh, the transaction in, is initiated, a node starts a transaction by creating it and then signing it digitally with a private key. 
The private key is created using cryptographic um, techniques, basically. Um, next, the block represents different actions or um, commands in a uh, blockchain. It is usually a um, data structure that represents transfer of um, values between different uh, users on the blockchain network. And uh, data structure usually uh, contains source and destination addresses, relevant rules, and um, other validation information for that transaction and the user. The block is then broadcasted to all the nodes in the network, and the network nodes um, then verify and validate the created block and uh, the transaction. Uh, the approved block is then placed on the blockchain, on the chain. And uh, this new block is then added to the ledger, and the next is linked, and the next block is linked cryptographically to the previous block. Um, the very final step is um, that the transaction is verified and then executed. So um, now we are uh, talking about the categories for programming languages used in the blockchain technology. So the blockchain programming languages are uh, grouped into four main categories. First, we have the general purpose programming languages, blockchain specific programming languages, object oriented programming languages, or called ORPs, and uh, the procedural programming languages. The general purpose programming languages are mostly used in the software development industry beyond blockchain. They are used to create blockchain networks and uh, applications that are um, for, and that are on these networks, on the blockchain networks. Uh, different programming languages are often used um, on the same blockchain because the blockchain have the, has that capability to host a, a selection of different um, applications. A variety of um, a variety of uh, these programming languages have been created uh, in accordance with the industry expansion that we will talk about it later. These programming languages have one specific uh, purpose, which is to create smart contracts. Again, we will talk about smart contracts shortly. Uh, for object-oriented programming languages, uh, programming logic combines data such as a smart contract's field name with methods such as the instructions for the software to execute the certain functions. And these programming languages make it easier for users to reuse or update uh, existing program codes. Uh, the feature of reuse or update um, makes the ORPs or object-oriented programming languages code uh, more useful uh, for com complicated um, software solutions. Uh, procedural programming languages uh, on the other side are different to ORPs. Uh, these programming languages don't combine data um, or fields and the uh, methods or functions in the same entities or objects. Um, the other thing, the other good thing about procedural programming languages is that they have faster code execution and fewer lines of code, um, which makes it more user friendly and more easier for um, everybody to just use it. So the relationship of programming languages to the blockchain technology. Programming languages are used to build decentralized applications or dApps, smart contracts, and the infrastructure in the blockchain technology. Decentralized applications um, have back-end code running on decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. A dApp um, can have its front That in code functions and methods are from the back end, actually. Uh, the decentralized applications are open source applications, and they have a decentralized nature, provide incentivization, and have an algorithm. Smart contracts are uh, kind of programs stored in the blockchain and run when predetermined conditions are met. We will talk about them in detail uh, shortly. Uh, blockchain technology overlaps uh, traditional contracts by including the terms of agreement between parties, but exceeds them uh, using smart contracts by automating the execution of contracts in a distributed environment. The basic element of blockchain infrastructure includes nodes and clients, clusters, and security. Uh, nodes are the core components of the proof of stake or POS, 
I think I have to go through here. Oh, no. Sorry. Um, or POS uh, infrastructure. Uh, proof of stake or POS is a type of the blockchain technology mechanism used to validate cryptocurrency uh, transactions. Uh, using this systems, owners of the cryptocurrency can stake their coins, uh, which gives them the right to um, check a new blocks of the transactions, and they will be able to add them uh, to the blockchain. A node carries out a key function of the network. Uh, this includes validating transactions, storing records of the blockchain, or storing votes of uh, votes uh, on the network governance. Uh, the present uh, the, the person that indicates um, storing the person the person that indicates how these functions are performed is a, is called a client. Um, this, the decentralized network can support a variety of software implementation or client uh, depending on the design of the network. Uh, clients can be built into influence a variety of programming languages and they can exist uh, in a variety of implementations. So now we are talking about some different uh, blockchain platforms, starting with Ethereum, which is one of the most popular and um, uh, more than one of the most popular and um, people mostly use it, especially for smart contracts in the blockchain. So Ethereum is immutable and easy to deploy and store on chain. Ethereum was first made on 2013 and was officially launched on 2015. Uh, Ethereum is an open source application that provides a framework that allows developers uh, to build decentralized applications. The decentralized applications run on peer-to-peer -peer networks and on single uh, computers. The decentralized applications are on the internet and they are not owned or can, uh, controlled by a uh, single company uh, or, on, by the way, the private companies. Uh, Ethereum, is an, um, as I said, is an open source, uh, globally regional, re regionalized uh, computing structure uh, that executes smart contracts. Uh, this platform uses a uh, blockchain to um, coordinate and, and store the state of a system along with the Ether cryptocurrency, um, which is very popular. Again, you've heard about probably to limit execute um, to limit execution uh, resource cost. Uh, the Ethereum platform allows to create powerful applications. Um, these Ethereum-based powerful applications have economic functions and provide high availability, transparency, naturality, and auditability. And all these features helps to reduce and eliminate the control and counterparty risks within the Ethereum smart contracts or um, within the Ethereum um, platform, basically. So um, there are some other blockchain platforms that um, I have focused on my research, which we don't have enough time to talk about the details of these. I can um, say Bitcoin, which is the most one of the most famous ones. Um, we can say Quora, uh, which is another uh, new and uh, famous uh, platform, Hyperledger Fabric and uh, Cardano. And uh, now we are going to briefly um, talk about the different programming languages um, used in these platforms. And as you can see in the screen, there are some um, old programming languages like Python, Java, JavaScript, C++, which previously, even before the blockchain existence, were, have been used. And uh, some other newer ones like Solidity, Kotlin, Scala, which you might heard about or you might not because they are kind of new um, programming languages that are uh, used in the blockchain technology. Uh, new programming languages have um, evolved uh, from the older or um, commonly used uh, programming languages. For example, uh, Solidity is working sometimes in the Java environment. Uh, new programming languages means uh, new features for the application, for the blockchain application. Um, there are uh, lesser lines of code when users build applications using these programming languages. Uh, the new programming languages allow users to link in a, a new way that is not represented by the older programming languages. And classes and methods have been set to default um, when using new languages. 
this is because developers were highly overusing inheritance uh, when building um, applications. And uh, new communities and um, ecosystems are created around new programming languages uh, for the blockchain and technology. Um, now I'm going to talk about two, uh, I mean, I chose two of these um, new programming languages called Simplicity and Morales. Um, there are different features um, uh, for each of them. So Simplicity programming language runs without loops or um, recursion and is designed uh, to be used for cryptocurrencies and blockchain applications, as I mentioned before. It, is, it also offers um, greater flexibility and expressiveness than the Bitcoin script. Uh, the language allows users to verify safety, security, and costs of the program. The aim of Simplicity is to improve the way smart contracts are written. Uh, the language is highly compatible with a variety of platforms, and it's still uh, a new language and hasn't been adopted by a large number of companies, which I think, based on the researches, it will be in the, in the near future. Uh, then the Morales programming language is uh, pr primarily used for the web development uh, and provides a, a developed backend for users. Uh, the reason for a pre-development backend is to provide users and developers convenience and help them to avoid uh, the complex process of uh, building backend on their own. Um, so the software development kit, which is offered by the Morales, uh, is used uh, with JavaScript code. And uh, developed functions are provided by this SDK, um, which helps users to save on resources and time. Um, some convenient functionalities provided by SDK include logging in for users, uh, fetching balances from NFTs uh, to interchangeable tokens, uh, fetching transactions, uh, fetching events for smart contracts, and sending transactions. So. Uh, here we have some pros and cons of uh, pros and cons of the older versus newer uh, programming um, languages. Um, so the newer uh, programming languages sometimes are high, have higher speeds. Uh, they're independent. And they can be used in multiple uh, platforms. Uh, they have large memory storage and um, offer several libraries and frameworks. And on the other hand, they are um, complex. Um, they have less support. Uh, sometimes we have some performance issues. And uh, there are some uh, issues um, with the libraries um, as well with um, those languages. And sometimes this, um, so, some of these features, some of the things happen with the older languages as well. So there should be a, um, a very in-depth look to the uh, type of the platform to choose which programming languages is more adaptable um, with, with it. So now we are uh, talking uh, more. Um, we are talking about more details of the smart contracts in the blockchain. So the smart contracts are uh, defined as a digital form of uh, promises, um, which include um, some protocols that are the parties uh, uh, perform. And smart contracts are not the same as other contracts. These contracts are computer programs, as we know they are smart. Uh, under certain circumstances, uh, blockchain-based contracts, uh, which are called smart contracts, implement code automatically. Uh, different types of user activity uh, occur with these contracts. For example, cryptocurrency payments are being supported by these um, smart contracts uh, without the need for any human interaction. Um, the smart contracts um, programs or code stored on the blockchain and that's run when the predetermined conditions are met. Um, these contracts are used uh, for the execution, um, automation of um, um, agreements so that the users can quickly um, know about the outcomes without interference or loss of time. Smart contracts work with, work with simple um, phrase like if or when and then. So if or when this happens, then what happens? What is the consequence or outcome? Uh, this is statement, it, it, they work with this statement um, that uh, are written into the code on a blockchain. Uh, when the predetermined conditions are met, uh, the computers execute uh, the code and it is verified by the developers. 
Uh, during this process, uh, funds are sent to appropriate people, notifications are sent, tickets are issued, and uh, lastly, the blockchain is updated and the transaction is set to be completed. So um, we are talking about the attacks and vulnerabilities and the security aspect of um, the blockchain technology a little bit right now. The fact that Ethereum, like we chose Ethereum, I chose Ethereum because Ethereum is very popular, as uh, I mentioned previously. The fact that the Ethereum smart contracts are accurately executed is a requirement for their effectiveness. Otherwise, the adversary could uh, tamper with execution to redirect funds uh, from a legitimate participant to um, him or herself. Uh, however, the correctness of execution alone is insufficient to ensure the security of smart contracts in Ethereum, for example. Indeed, various security flaws in Ethereum smart contracts have been uncovered. Uh, but thanks to both hands-on development um, expertise and um, static analysis of the Ethereum blockchain contracts, some real attacks against Ethereum contracts have taken use of these flaws, uh, resulting in financial damages, unfortunately. The most successful example of these um, attacks is um, when the attackers managed to steal $60 million uh, from a contract. Um, actually, this transaction, the consequence where it was canceled following the blockchain patch, but it shows the vulnerability and uh, the lack of security uh, within these uh, transactions here. Um, so there are various reasons why smart contract development in Ethereum is particularly prone to failures. A major portion of them are linked to Solidity, uh, the programming language that is used in Ethereum. Ethereum Ethereum's high level programming language, but with vulnerabilities, but with some errors that end up in this uh, cybersecurity issue. A discrepancy, a discrepancy uh, between Solidity's um, semantics and program's uh, perception appears to be the source of many problems for this um, platform. The issue is that while Solidity appears to be a type JavaScript-like language, it implements several of these features um, in its unusual manner. At the same time, uh, the language lacks tools to address domain-specific issues, uh, such as the fact that processing steps are um, recorded on a public blockchain, um, where they can be reordered or delayed in unpredict unpredictable manner. Another example uh, for the um, programming error, program language error, and bug in the blockchain platform is for the Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, Hyperledger Fabric um, code runs in a secured uh, Docker container that is isolated from the endorsing peer process. However, it, this is insufficient to, previous, uh, to prevent malicious code uh, from being written. The main concern is that the code is accessible on the network and the use of Docker greatly constrains about uh, what the code can do. So um, the vulnerabilities uh, and security on the blockchain technology. A blockchain system can simply be exploited through uh, any vulnerability that might contribute to a cryptographic solution because it is clear that any programming error or lack of secure private key might be the basis of large security breach. A crypto attacker should theoretically be unable to decipher the original plain text, which is encrypted, but the format of the blocks is not difficult to comprehend. Uh, and even a good cryptograph can produce a plain text, but certain letters or numbers appear in the same location in each block in the blockchain because it's like repeated sometimes it happens. This allows the attacker to try a partial representation of the plain text in each crypto protected block, uh, where each block is a function of the one before it. So they have, sometimes they have a kind of pattern and that is uh, the, um, the start point for uh, this vulnerability is uh, being exploited and this um, cybersecurity uh, attacks and data breaches. Uh, remote access Trojan or RAT malware is also created, allowing it to gain a foothold in a corporate network uh, to scan and attack systems. Given the level of access required, installing malicious code will be a difficult will be a, a difficult task um, for the most threat actors. Um, there are nonetheless possible scenarios. 
for example, an attack uh, attacker should, uh, could con uh, construct a new ledger with malicious code, persuade others to join the ledger, and then publish an update. Um, it's it was nothing uh, that when the code is yes. Two minutes remaining. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, I, I just I just wrap it up right now. Um, so yeah, this way the cyber attacker can just um, go ahead and have that um, cyber have, have have make problem for that um, transactions and for the blockchain that um, they have, and also. Um, Another key uh, factor contributing to the spread of insecure smart contract is that the documentation of known vulnerabilities is distributed across a variety of sources, including the official documentation, research papers, and internet discussion groups. But there is still a need for a complete self-contained and up-to-date survey of Ethereum or other platforms, smart contract vulnerabilities uh, within the blockchain, which um, I will probably continue and hopefully continue it and um, RM2 and get some new results out of that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lillian, for your presentation. Thanks for listening to my presentation. T time for questions. Yes, go ahead, Ibuvici. Can you see his uh, question? Yes. Yes, yes. I'm just writing it. Smart contract slide in my chat. Mm, so by not legally binding, um, that's uh, not kind of uh, what it means. They are actually legally binded because there are some rules and regulations behind that and um, there should be uh, under some certain rules. But as you know, that in almost in every uh, other contracts, there are some illegal um, actions that are mm, done by some people through the contracts even the smart contracts are not free of those illegal actions. Um, so the nature of smart contracts is legal, it's not illegal, and uh, but but those illegal things that happens into the smart contract, I, I wanted to say that there are still some illegal things happens in, in, into these contracts, very similar to the uh, usual contracts that we already have. So smart contracts are almost, um, have the same problems. I hope I answered your question. So what's the closest, um, um, Omo Colette, uh, can you please, um, like, what, what do you mean by this question? Okay, if you don't mind. So uh, what I mean is that um, I'm trying to wrap up, uh, my head around uh, what uh, is smart contract. So, I mean, if you can explain in layman terms, uh, plain English, if you don't mind. Um, so, uh, from what I understand is that um, you, you want to say like in the real life, how do these smart contracts work? For example, if you go through a um, kind of website and uh, you want to buy, this is very um, popular right now to buy some stuff with Bitcoin, uh, exchanging instead of money, exchanging Bitcoin. So when you want to give money to someone who you don't know, there are no banks, no transactions, um, no, no people to just um, go through those transactions that you make with the other person. There should be a kind of contract between you that um, shows their outcome, shows the conditions, this kind of stuff. So real time uh, real life scenario is kind of that for the smart contracts it's exactly the same as those contracts that we have on the other aspects uh, other than the smart contracts for example you go to the bank you want to open an account you have contract this is the same thing but uh, working with the blockchain with the blockchain platforms with the blockchain tokens and all those stuff so you have to have these smart contracts it's kind of different form of those contracts Good, great. And we have Thank a comment you. from Jeff that Alberta has recognized the smart contract uh, signatories as bind binding in real estate and the construction. Great. Yeah, those are those are pretty standard contracts, the CCDC for construction and the real estate agreements. And so those can be transferred electronically, can be signed electronically by multiple parties, and those signatories are recognized as legal and binding. That's right. And we have another comment from Sean that a smart contract is basically a regular contract, but in good form. 
they are subject to the law of the code. They are said not to be enforceable, but because many uh, times transactions happen in different legal justification. And I also want to remind you guys uh, for our guests from outside Concordia University of Edmonton who don't have a Concordia email address, please register on the following form to receive your attendance certificate. So let's move on to the uh, second presentation today from Franco Jaraba. Franco works as a network engineer with around 10 years of experience in different fields, including utilities, manufacturing, oil and gas, and beverage and foods. He has been involved in many data center deployments for multinational companies in Latin America, North America, Europe, and Asia. He has been involved in consulting services for the last year, and his main focus is in network and virtualization infrastructures. So please go ahead, Franco. Thank you, Professor. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, good. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Professor uh, indicated, my name is Franco. I'm a, a student in Concordia University. And today's present presentation, I'm going to talk about the exploring the security of software defined network controllers. So, uh, in, in today's agenda, we're going to have just five topics. Again, it's just a brief information. This is a, this is a, a wide, um, not discovery technology that we can dig, I mean, uh, deeper, but I just want to touch base with you and, uh, and, uh, and explain what this is the technology about, um, mention what is the problem definition, I mean, how this technology is dealing with the current te uh, topologies. Um, the objectives of my research, others' ideas on, on, the, on how to mitigate, in this case, a distributed denial of services attacks. And at the end, I'm going to present some demo um, and, uh, and how a DDoS attacks. So <clears throat> what is a software defined network? Let's go back just um, a little bit to understand where this technology is coming from. The, Traditional uh, network topology are based on individual configuration. So let's say if we have a virtual machine located in one data center that need to have communication through a network topology and then reach host, hypervisor, or other virtual machines, the networking engineer what need to do is start making some specific configuration in the switch located in one data center and then move to another data center and do the specific configuration. So if this virtual machine need to have communication with one of these hosts or, or virtual machines, the network uh, engineer will need to establish trunk configuration, VLAN configuration, access list in each of them. So if we have 20 switches or 50 switches, router, firewall, what need to be done is individually, right? So that's a hard task. I mean, that's a, uh, something that as a networking engineer, again, we don't want to deal with that. So that's why the software defined network was in developed. What the software defined network uh, does is do that configuration in a centralized way. So this, the controller will make the specific configuration in each switch to establish or to make the, the, the desired communication, right? How can we do that? Through the Python um, uh, scripts in an automatic way. And the controller is communicating, I mean, the, the way that the controller has communication to the switches is using uh, an open flow, um, communication protocol. Of course, there are some vendors like Cisco that they have, they have their own um, communication protocol. They have their um, uh, own solution. For example, Cisco has their DNA uh, ACI to establish this, I mean, to, to make this configuration in a distributed way, or Vingware has the uh, NSX, right? 
So, but what, what is the problem with this solution? What is the problem with, with, with this uh, new technology? As a uh, new technology, it comes with software bugs. You know, it can be vulnerable and it can have a number of vulnerabilities, but I'm gonna be focused only on the DDoS attacks, right? So how, uh, how a DDoS attacks can disrupt an application. So let's say we have a, a web application running in a, in a network topology, and we have a number of hosts connected to this web application, and all of these hosts are going to establish um, an UDP connection, which is the most known attack in UDP connection, but never ending. And it will, it will have like a number um, a number <clears throat> of packets coming from the host to the server until the server get down. I mean, the services get down. So how the uh, attacks can be mitigated? Um, there are too many ways, um, pro proposed ways are not, I mean, uh, they're still under development, but I'm gonna be focused only on these five, um, way to mitigate a DDoS attack. The first one is using a policy-based security application. Basically here, what the author uh, proposed is to use an application located in the northbound terminal. That means an external application. It is not located in the SDN control itself. It's just located externally. And then retrieve information from all the flows across the network. That's mean it's a network analyzer, right? And then compare this traffic to a policy established in the, in, 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 in the application, right? So we can achieve security, we can achieve quality of services, we can have even um, blocking in undesired traffic. What is the problem with this solution? Legitimate traffic, like uh, hosts that are communicating or, or have communication to the server, uh, that communication will be affected because this um, solution does not, I mean, does not discard attack packets, but host um, communication. The other solution is using entropy. Basically, uh, entropy is uh, the amount of bandwidth uh, utilized or used in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a trunk. And it's measured by the number of packets that is forward, forward to a single host. So let's say we have uh, hundreds of hosts. And, and if 99 hosts are uh, sending packets to just the remaining hosts, that means the entropy for that host is highest, is the maximum value. So that's, that's the entropy. Again, this does not uh, make you know, uh, attacks, packets filter, they just drop the communication uh, um, from, the, from, the, from the host. So that's not our purpose. We, I mean, the, our desire or our objective is just discard the packets from the attacker, right? The cumulative sum is kind of the same as an entropy, but uh, here the authors um, use the um, fluctuation in the in the in, in trunks channels. So if we have an an abrupt an abrupt change um, in a, in, a, in a short time, that means a lot of packets are going or are coming from a specific host, right? Um, again, this is effective. Right, because we are releasing bandwidth, we are we are just taking away some packet, but legitimate legitimate traffic can be affected as well. Network function virtualization. I like this solution because um, the the author um, uh, recommend to use um, micro segmentation using network virtual machines on demand. So if one of the virtual machine is sending a lot of broadcast or multicast, what the um, application or what the solution is going to do is to do micro segmentation 
through the virtual machines. And this virtual machine is going to be deployed on demand, which is really good, which we, I mean, as, a, as a, a good solution for that. Maybe, again, um, uh, legitimate traffic can be affected as well if, if we don't implement uh, micro segmentation in a proper way. And data plane layer, what the author recommend here is to establish access list in the port where the host, the attacker host is connected. In this way, we are gonna have, or we are not, we're gonna release bandwidth in the uplink layer, in the uplink connections, right? So again, this is an, another good solution because um, beside, I mean, beside of uh, uh, disrupting the, the, the attack, package we are going to release um uplink uh i mean we're going to release bandwidth in the uplink uh, 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 communication so let's uh let's uh check um the demo i think you can understand better um how this technology work um so i'm gonna present now my screen the entire screen here this one Okay, I guess you should be able to see my screen there. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, good. Let me move this one here. So here I have an Anos. This is an SDN controller in an open source solution, right? And I'm going to show you how the um, topology look like in our implementation. So basically, we, are, we have our SDN controller connected through the open flow protocol communication to three switches. Each switch is connected to one host, right? And there is a, a connection between all of three switches. It's a tri triangle topology, right? So basically, this is our communication and, and topology. And uh, the, the, the uh, SDN controller, what it's going to do is to make configuration in each switch, right, to uh, specify the traffic or the flow between the hosts. So <clears throat> this is the interface. We have host two, host one, and host three. And this is our IP address, MAC address. And we I'm not um, assigning any VLAN just for simplicity, you know. And this is our switch two. This is our switch three. And this is our switch one. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go the console. So the one at the, at the top is our, uh, the, the SDN controller. It's called Anos. And the one at the bottom is meaning it. Both, both are running locally in our Oracle virtual box, right? So uh, Anos services are, are running. I'm not going to show you, I mean, all the configuration. I just want to go to specific, uh, I mean, um, uh, utility you know like how this work and and meaning it what i did is just i just create um a topology called mesh in python and i point into my controller which is this ip address ending in 1 to 54. if we go to the interface that's my ip address okay good so in onos we have a lot of um utilities again this is not only for open source solution we can use uh this utility for communication between cisco switches so we can have drivers for cisco driver for uh hewlett packer driver for juniper so we can use this um SDN controller to manage uh, our, you know, uh, uh, switches, right, or rotors. So here, uh, 
in ONOS, we can see devices connected to, um, to the SDN controller. So we have three switches. Switch one, I don't know if you can see, uh, let's see. Okay, switch one, switch two, and switch three. Each switch is um, an open uh, switch. This is the software, uh, this, the, 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 the version. And this is the management address for each one. In this case, it's uh, an open flow protocol. And also I can see all the hosts connected to our SDN controller. So I can see host one with IP address ending in one, host two with IP address ending in two, and host three with IP address ending in three, right? So we should be able to pin each other. So this host one, this is host two, and this is host three. So if we want to go to check our IP address, is host one, IP address host one, IP address host two is ending in two, IP address host three is ending in three. So I'm gonna just ping 10.1.1.2. That one, that one, that one, that I'm sorry, 10.0.0.0.2. That zero, that zero, that zero, that so I have pin, right? So if we go to our um, topology, we will be able to see fl one flow between host one and host but not flow between host one and host three. So let's uh, do a pin to host three. So now I have host three and host two, but not, and host two and host one, but not one and host three, right? So let's do the pin, three, uh, pin one. Good, so now we have pin across the network. But what is the real advantage of this technology? And is the most remarkable solution for this new technology? And it's the use of APIs or APIs. Basically, if we check the flows in our switch, we're gonna see switch one, these are all the flows, switch two, these are all the flows and switch three, these are all the flows. So if we check flows located in switch one, we will see that there are some core um, packets like ARP requests, like LDP, like BDDP, but also we will see this packet that is coming from this um, internet source and is going to this destination and the reply. But who is in charge Franco, to- Franco, can you please increase the font size? Sure, sure. Oh, yeah. Um, customize Windows reference. Let's see. Oh. Hmm. Logging. Here we are. Oh, what is that? What is that? Organization, advanced login, user interface, on large. Let's see. But I think I will need to uh, show. I'm going to close this one and I'm going to open again. Oh, no. Showing just this one as a large. Hmm. Connection tab, size, no, Windows. I don't know what is that, Professor. I think I'm yeah. going to spend. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine. You can continue. Okay, I'm going to use. Um, oh, hold on, devices. This. Close. So here, let's see. So here we will see all the um, communication that is going, going through the network. 
right? But also we will be able to see um, what application is in charge to make that communication successful. So let's see, I'm gonna um, start the ONUS again. And I'm gonna just clear. This way that this should be active. It's started, but it's not active. I'm gonna give you just a couple of seconds there. So this application, the forward is in charge to, as the name indicates, forward all the application, uh, all the uh, package between the host, right? So if I if I stop this application, no one will be able to. I mean, no one will be responsible for forward that package. That means we are going to lose communication um, from one host to another host. Right, but we don't want we don't want to do that. What we want is just uh, disrupt the specific communication in um, in a DDoS attacks. So, for example, uh, let's see. So, for example, here you go. We have zero percent of drop that means all the hosts can reach each other right but if we want to if we want to stop that communication we just stop these services and now no one will be able to communicate each other so pin all you will have um, 100 packets drop. So how can we establish that communication between the hosts? Again, we don't need to go over all the switches. We only need to do a specific command, which is add host. And um, indicate the ID for the host that we want to have communication. So for example, I'm gonna have communication between host three and host two. So what we what we have to do is just indicate the ID for host three and host two. And there you go. What this SDN controller is gonna do is um, allow <clears throat> the traffic between those hosts with the source IP, with the source ID and the destination ID. So if we if we do host three pin host two, then we have communication. But if we are going to do host one pin host two, then we don't have communication because there is not any rule indicated in the SDN controller to allow that, that traffic. So if, if we check what application is in charge to allow that traffic, we will see that the application in charge is called intent. Because now I indicated, or I, I'm just telling the SDN controller what traffic should be going through the network, right? Excuse me, Franco, two minutes remaining. Sure. So basically uh, here, we can I mean, think in a wide open possibilities to uh, block traffic based on the uh, application. Because not only I can you know, do um, or allow all the traffic, but I can say, give or check the application ID, check the, band, the bandwidth or establish a bandwidth, indicate the billing ID or source IP address, this, the, the IP protocol, the TCP port, I mean, too many ways to uh, to establish this. I just want to show you, let me see if I can do this, um, an attack. I don't think we will have time, but uh, let's see. Uh,
So no, I don't. We don't have time. So basically, um, an attack is done using a uh, HPIN common, which will be send a lot of packets from one host, uh, from two hosts to one host, and then that specific port or a specific application will be stopped based on the number of requests. So yeah, in general uh, way, that's how the SDN controller and that's the utility or the, the you know, the, the advantage of, 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 of this new technology. I think that's all, Professor. Thanks so much, Franco. It's a nice presentation. Time for questions. Yes. Uh, OK. Yes, it will be Ching. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Franco, for the nice presentation. It was uh, eye opening for us. So my question would be, um, based on your topic, um, you, you are looking at uh, how SDN is able to help also prevent uh, DDoS attack. And if I use your, your topology to ask you uh, to, you only have one controller, how does, uh, with SDN, you have limited number of controllers, how does controller, using the controller help mitigate this DDoS attack, considering that it will now mean uh, a single point of failure? Okay, good, good, good question, Nebupichi. SDN control can be in a high availability uh, environment. So you can have a primary and a backup solution. Um, and also you can deploy not only local solution, but distributor solution. In case one of the SDN controller goes down, another, not located locally, but externally, can support or can take all the functionality of this SDN controller. But yeah, you can have primary and backup solution. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. So thank you so much, Lillian and Franco, for your uh, interesting presentations. And thank you all for being with us today. We will see you uh, in September. We hope uh, good vacations for everyone and enjoy the summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Franco and Lillian.